Hello, welcome to Old and New, our show about navigating age 50 to 100 with patience and joy. I'm Adam Zand. I'm here with my co-host. Hi, I'm Hallie Tucker. And today, I think we're going to be looking back a bit at the episodes we've done all on a variety of subjects about aging. Yeah, I think this will be fun. This will give us a chance, well, also for our audience, people who might have missed some of the shows, but also a chance for us to sort of look back and highlight some of the guests that we've had. So why don't you take the first show, Hallie? Okay. So we started our first episode of Old and New on the subject of work. And with work, many people think about, all oh, right, so the traditional I'll retire when I'm 65 and play golf the rest of my life or whatever. But we think for this generation, it's going to be very different and very creative. And as for takeaways from that show and reasons to watch it, there were so many creative solutions to how you might work. And also some bad news about many people want to work after 65 but find that they can't because of wellness, illness, different reasons. Yeah, it really set us up for future shows in a way. It was our pilot episode, but um, we were joined by Bob Collins. And I thought Bob did a great job of talking about pick something you're passionate about as you age. Uh, you might not even be experienced at it, but you're going to learn. You're going to learn on the job. You're going to uh, be involved. And really uh, think about creating value first and then you're going to create the job coming out of that. I think he was really spot on. And we also touched on the gig economy. We might be working after 65, but it might be a little of this and a little of that. So should we look at a, a bit from that episode? Should let's, we look at a clip? Let's take a look at a clip. OK. What skills are most useful for anybody, but especially seniors, to stay competitive? I think the most important thing for anybody, and but even particularly seniors, um, and I would almost equate uh, people going into college and coming out of college uh, in the same boat as seniors. I think they all need to be entrepreneurs in their own life. And that sounds like a catchphrase or something of that nature, but there's a couple of core, core aspects of a, of a strong entrepreneur. They're passionate about what they do. Um, they kind of go out and pave their own way with regards to how they want to design their world around them and the interests they want to do. And more importantly, they get involved. They actually start to, um, if they want to be involved in a particular career, they actually start to actually do some of the work independent of being paid for it. They start to actually become, uh, this is a, a in the day and age of bloggers um, and, uh, and complete access to almost any technology you can to kind of give yourself a voice and, uh, and a, a uh, and a platform. Yes. Um, you can actually share just about anything that you have a strong opinion on. You can actually start to kind of create content, create community, uh, uh, create value. Um, you don't go in and say, I would like this job because I think I could be good at it. What you do is, I want to create this job, and here's how I'm already doing amazing things in this area, being involved in your community, being involved in a, um, in a school system, uh, being involved at a, at, a, you know, at a company as well, just taking on side projects and say, I see a problem here, I see a need here, I'm going to get some people around me, and I'm going to drive this forward initiative so it can have an impact. And that doesn't happen by someone saying, ooh, I just saw your your resume, or I was right. just pointing to you by five other people. It involves about you actually being impactful in your own life and designing it their own way. The same as it goes for seniors, as it goes for people coming right out of school trying to create their own, their own start their own career. Sounds exactly on the money. Thank you. Episode two looked at med tech, and it's kind of funny looking back because our very first discussions about doing a TV show together, we're talking about how seniors were dealing with technology. We thought we were going to look at all sorts of companies every week. It's obviously expanded well beyond that. On that episode, though, we heard a really cool entrepreneurial story. Iggy Fanlow was our guest, and he founded Lively.com. Lively looked at connecting uh, adults with their caregivers and also having their families involved in a holistic approach to medicine. Our other guest that episode was Carissa Caramanis O'Brien. I've known Carissa for years through social media and also her knowledge about healthcare and health technology, unparalleled. Uh, you talked to Carissa. What were some of your takeaways from that part? 
she's very good on the subject of technology and medicine in the simplest sense that a doctor might reach out to a senior using Skype or online. But she's also even better on the subject of connecting every day, that that creates wellness to be talking to people. Don't be alone in your room. You need to use the computer and your phone and other ways to connect with other people, younger, older, lots of people, and that will help you be well. Let's take a look at a clip. Facebook fact that I found pretty interesting that just in 2013, adults 65 and over on Facebook were 45% of the community. But within one year, by 2014, it was 56%. So it is growing at leaps and bounds. So um, can you give me just a sense of what you think is going on with seniors and social media and health? Yeah, so you want to tackle that last topic first? Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think it's an exciting trend. It's an interesting one when we look at um, where it's come just in the last few years. You know, we know uh, wholly 35% of seniors are now actively using social media on a regular basis. And those that are active are using it to connect with members of their personal networks on a daily or near daily basis. So they've become one of the most engaged populations in social media, and that's not just Facebook alone, but, um, but also sort of the broader um, set of social media and social tools. Um, we're seeing a lot of seniors embracing online communities, and that includes you know, online communities for health. Um, so it's really an exciting trend. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's one of the sharpest uh, growth trajectories for any you know, sort of subpopulation that uh, the research looks at. Um, and it really, I think, is a, is a telling statistic for those um, in the industry that serve the senior population, but yeah. also, you know, those that, um, that care uh, for perhaps senior members of their family um, to be sort of aware of that increasing use and how they're using it and why. Right. Uh, we know that more and more seniors are using their phones and they have smartphones and there is some great research that was done at Pew. They asked um, younger people and older people did they consider their smartphone something that was a leash or something that gave them freedom. So 82 percent of the smartphone owning seniors said it was a freedom. It was an item of freedom. Mm -hmm. And it was the 18 to 29 year olds who said it was a leash, yep. which I thought was, <laughs> yeah. wouldn't you think it would be the other way? Well, it's or, funny. I, I think it's it's sort of around the, the use model for each of those populations. Mm -hmm. So for the younger uh, group, they saw it as a leash because they're thinking of it as a device that connects them more, like, more than likely to work. Yes. Right, so it's a leash that keeps them, for better or worse, connected to their daily obligations, their work life, um, and perhaps keeps them maybe a little disconnected from mm -hmm. the other more, more enjoyable aspects of life. For seniors, because their smartphone use tends to be more narrow in, um, you know, they're using it for more often those more pleasurable connections, whether it might be their increasing use of social media, um, staying in touch with their grandkids, things mm -hmm. like that, um, or perhaps for improving some of the things like, you know, managing their own health care, things like that, um, they see it as a connecting tool. So they, they saw it both as, uh, I think the words that the study showed were connecting and, and freeing or liberating. Right. That they, they associated those, um, sent, you know, those feelings and emotions with smartphones rather than that that leash that maybe those of us in the younger population sometimes feel. Episode three was a personal favorite for many reasons. We looked at wellness and movement and welcomed a couple of guests uh, to teach us about something called NIA, which is a form of movement. But we really, we looked more holistically about how do we stay healthy? How do we stay involved? Um, our two guests were Roseanne Russell. She's a NIA instructor, a yoga instructor taken classes with her for about 10 years. And uh, one of the students um, is Alice Godet. It's great having them both in, but what I want to hear about is the dance moves that Hallie invented for the start of that episode. 
All right, so I was just ridiculous. And you, it's on tape, it's on video, we can watch me. But these guys are excellent dancers and the kind of dance is a new kind of dance I've never done. Um, I probably did look like an idiot, but it's, it doesn't matter. And to see somebody who's in her 80s, was that right? No. She was fabulous, that was um, yeah. Alice. So anyway, it's a fun show to watch. And if you are interested in a kind of fitness that might be new to you, and might be something you think, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, as you age, and maybe your joints are a little not what they used to be, to be able to move and dance without any high impact. And it's a really great thing. I was yeah. really happy to learn about it. And it was a great show. It was a great episode. It was fun so, to do. So here's my takeaways from the interview, because we sat down after we did our dance and after we did our Nia, we talked to Alice, we talked to Roseanne. And I, I think some of the, the takeaways for people are Pick something that's sustainable. You know, you don't want to just dive into something and feel like it's regimented and you have to do it every day. It's got to be something you enjoy, hopefully with a community of people who you enjoy. And I guess the second takeaway that I got out of that was just realize we're all works of art. We kind of have to take care of our bodies as such. And it doesn't have to just be in the class. You can sort of integrate movement, if it's Nia, or integrate some of the fitness things that you're thinking about I guess lastly, Roseanne said, choose the life you want, and she wanted to choose joy, and she wanted to choose a little bit of patience, echoing our themes, but having fun with it. So let's go to a clip. I'm sort of noticing a lot of pressure when you think about exercise to, what's the expression, no pain, no gain. Um, I mean, you sort of proved we were laughing, we were having a good time, your classes are like that. Are we just being trained the wrong way to think about exercise? Well, truthfully, the, I mean, we all know what it feels like to be very happy in our body. If you go for a walk like outside, and especially on a nice spring day, soon we'll be able to open up the windows, and you feel it. You feel joyful. And so we have the ability inside of us to always access joy. Um, the body loves joy. It thrives on joy. It actually, that's how we heal. That's how we we. we we stay young. And so when we're in a place, a situation where we're putting pressure on ourselves, we're, we're, we're evoking stress, uh, we're actually aging our body a little bit quicker by, by, by being more stressful. We have enough stress in our life, um, so you don't need it when you exercise. Although, for some people that works really well for them. Um, but so often, what, what I often see in my classes is people have grown out of that. They've grown out of killing themselves, going to the gym, and you know, they hate it, and it's, they've grown out of working out. And that's when they come to Nia class, or that's when they go to a yoga class, or even a Zumba class. That's when they start to discover the joy of movement, not the joy of working out. I mean, who wants to work? Episode four was about caregiving, you remember. And caregiving's a touchy subject. One of our guests told us you could end up needing care, or you could be a person giving care, or you will be a person likely doing all of that in your life. We had a great time listening to the family care spokesperson for the AARP, for ARP, who joined us by Skype, Amy Goyer. And she had really a lot of useful and, and some poignant things to say about caregiving. I think that my takeaway was that you need to be open and understanding and flexible with people who are going through that. It's a really tough thing. And don't for a minute think you won't probably go through it yourself. And perhaps talk with your partner's family about if I, in my older age, needed caregiving, what would that look like? Yeah, I, I agree. I really like the way Amy both said, you're gonna be a caregiver, but you're also gonna pre prepare for how you wanna be taken care of. Right. And she went into living at home. What does that mean? How do you set up your home? What town do you live in? Is it walkable? Right. Um, do you have access to medical care? I, so I liked her personal story. You're right. She talked about being a caregiver, but also preparing for how we want to be taken care of. And like you said, having those conversations with family members and figuring out what do we want? What works for everybody? Um, I think in general, like she was great at 
telling her story, but also showing all the resources that are available. Like we've talked about on other topics to, um, that we covered tonight, there's a community out there, there's resources, there are people who have personal experiences, but there's also sort of uh, areas where we can dive in if you want specialization on something. Then my takeaway was that for a caregiver, there are many resources. Obviously, ARP provides many online, but caregivers are so stressed and so busy, they often don't reach out to those resources. So even as a friend of a caregiver, help somebody take some time to see, you know, they may want to go and be in a group and meet with other caregivers. Help them out to, to find those resources. That's what I took away. Yeah. Do you want to see a clip? Absolutely. Let's look at a clip. It was a great show. A lot of us are sort of thinking about uh, retirement, and I, I guess that it might be a good time to actually um, think about in terms of preparing for caregiving needs. Mm -hmm. um, and initially I was thinking financially, but maybe do you have sort of a, a general mindset that we should think about when uh, we're thinking about caregiving to come? Well, first of all, if you're a caregiver, you may be caring for, it, generally we look at it as people over the age of 18, you're caring for an adult. It may be that you're going to have be in a situation of caring for your spouse or your parents, which uh, I, such as I'm doing, a sibling like I did, your adult children who may have a disability or other issues going on. So you want to think about uh, that in terms of who you're going to be caring for. You also want to prepare for your own future in terms of caregiving and who's going to be taking care of us as we age. Uh, the first thing to think about is how you want to live. So if, for example, I know that as I age, I want to remain active. I want to have a community that I can access and be involved in and activities. Walkability is actually really big to me because I want to be able to walk places. I don't want to have to, you know, if I can't drive, how am I going to get places? So thinking about that sort of thing. Um, you want to think about your own health issues. As you're aging, uh, do you have existing health issues that will worsen or do you know how they will progress? Are there family history that, uh, you know, for example, my dad and my grandmother both had Alzheimer's. So I'm going to be thinking about as I age, what if, what if I get that? How do I want to prepare for that in terms of financially, as you say, but also where I live, who can take care of me, all of those sorts of things in need, all the legal issues. You want to make sure you have your uh, advanced directives, your, your wishes. Do you, you know, what kind of care do you want? Um, you want to think about who's going to be caring for you. We know that family caregivers provide the most care for us, and we want to know, do you want to live near family members so that it makes it easier for them to help and support you? And that can be a real decision-making process. Nine out of ten people want to age in their own home. So when you're looking at that, how do I age in my own home but also be near enough to family members that they can provide the sort support that I need? And then when you're looking at that, you also want to think about how the home is designed. I call it smart design. You want it to be help, good for people of all ages. So, uh, for example, a zero threshold entry into your home is good for you if you have trouble with steps. But it's also good if you're pushing a baby carriage or you're, you've got a big dog you're trying to get inside or, you know, all kinds of things like that. So think about smart design in your home. Uh, and then, you know, like you said, finances kind of underlie everything. And, and are you planning for the, the potentialities of what uh, financial needs you may have? Episode five looked at death and mourning. Pretty uh, emotional stuff for both of us and the people we were uh, talking to. We talked to Rabbi Earl Grohlman, who I've known for years through Temple Bethel in Belmont. And you talk to uh, Lauren Lawrence, who's a pastor in Lexington. That's right. And the fun part for me was uh, the rabbi was actually 91 years old. He was about to have his 91st birthday. And the pastor in Lexington at the UCC church uh, was uh, 27. And their experience with helping people through death and mourning and grieving was uh, surprisingly similar and their advice I, the big takeaway I, I got from it was that more than anything be there for people 
Yeah, I, I think uh, the rabbi, and, and at one point we actually, you know, he reached out and held my hands, and it really felt in some ways it was preparing for whatever we're going to go through with friends or family, right. uh, just a, kind of an emotional moment, and, and I think it worked well for people uh, on the crew that night too. But yeah, Rabbi Goldman stressed, be present for people who are mourning. And then when you are in mourning, um, don't feel like you're constrained by a process. Um, you know, there's no secret sauce to how you're going to feel each day, um, but try to stay connected with people, be available for people to support you and take care of you. It, it was quite an episode. It was. I would say the big takeaway, Lauren, the, the Reverend said, was uh, grieving takes the time it takes. And it may, exactly what you said, no secret sauce and no timetable because you really don't know how you're going to make it through sometimes. And both of their experience were really fundamental to living and living a wonderful life knowing you will not be here forever. Yeah. So I, I love that episode. It was a favorite. Great. Why don't we look at two clips? Look, look, let's look at the rabbi and look at the pastor talking about the topics. What is grief? Grief is an emotion. It's not a disease. Grief is as natural as eating when you're hungry, drinking when you're thirsty, sleeping when you're tired. Grief, Adam, is nature's way of healing a broken heart. Grief is love, never ever ready to say goodbye. So today we talk about closure. There's no closure. You don't get over it, you live with it. So this is, these are the natural emotions. And when people say, what do you do with people who are grieving? I walk in and I say nothing. And I don't come in with all of the pablum and say, I know how you feel. I don't know how they feel. It's God's will. God didn't tell me that. But somebody needed an angel up in heaven. I say to them, I don't know how you're feeling. But if you feel this way, I want you to know this. These are some of the normal feelings that people may feel. And you're not crazy if you feel this way. At first, when it happens, you don't even believe it. It's, it's a nightmare. Right. When you wake up, you find out it really didn't happen. You, you, you're numb. You, you feel like a spectator, people watching. Yep. You're, you're watching people come in and go. You, you, you feel angry. How can God do this to me? You're angry at life. You're angry at, you're even angry at the person who died. How could that person leave me alone? So there are all kinds of feelings, feelings of, of guilt. If only I should have, I could have. If only I didn't let him take the car out that night. If only mm. I went to the hospital earlier. If only, if only, if only. And, and talk about the physiological things that, that the way you will feel that you're, that where does grief hurt? It hurts everywhere, the, the head, the stomach, your, the way that you feel. And there's, and there's depression for many people. The way you get up in the morning, you don't wanna, you don't wanna face the day. Right. And I'll say, These are, if you feel this way, this is okay. okay. And some of the people will say, I'm so glad you told me this. I thought I was crazy. I'm driving my car and I come to a red light. I guess what, I, I forget whether it means stop or go. I go to make a bank deposit, slip and I forgot how. Yeah. I even forgot my own name. Grief is love, never ever ready to say goodbye. I always tell people that there's not a, there's not a specific time frame um, that we should be telling ourselves that we need to get over a death. I think some um, times deaths, especially if it's someone really close to you, that will stay with you for, for the rest of your life. I had, I had referenced my grandmother who died of ALS and I miss her every day, you know, and, and she died um, by now in, in, um, in 2000, uh, gosh, in 2008 by now. So it's been, it's been years um, and I miss her every day, you know, and, and I, for me, that's a way that I honor her and I honor her life and, and um, 
Yeah, I, I always just, I always tell families, please be gentle on yourself, you know, because deaths hit us and, and grief comes in waves. And sometimes, uh, you know, we've just, we've just got to be gentle on ourselves and be gentle with one another. This was a fun show. It was really great looking back at all the episodes. Usually at the end, we do a recap, but you saw it. We went all the way from our pilot episode all the way to the closing one on death and mourning. Kind of went full circle. It's true. We don't really need to recap much more, but we do need you to watch us on Facebook, on YouTube, Old and New TV. It's easy to find us, and please do like us. We post a lot of content that's just about all these interesting ways of moving from age 50 to 100. So do check us out on social media. We're there. More to come.